I am here. Uh, we've got a couple of folks who are presenting bills in other committees right now, so we will have uh, greater attendance when, uh, uh, as, as the meeting evolves. Uh, very pleased to have before us today an opportunity to hear from our friends at TenCare. Um, lots of information coming and going, and, and really I've asked that uh, TenCare come give us a presentation today as to uh, um, where they started, uh, where we are, and where we envision TenCare going in the future. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, to the to the uh, to the hot seat, uh, Director Stephen Smith. Uh, feel free to uh, bring whomever you'd like with you. Uh, as we get started, as as we get the PowerPoint presentation loaded, uh, as I look around my committee members, does anyone have any personal orders? Any uh, any issues need to take off your heart before before we begin? Okay, see some smiles, but no issues before so. Uh, Director Smith, thank you very much. We are glad to have you with us. Uh, folks who are watching, uh, we have this uh, PowerPoint presentation before us that you'll be able to see as well. Uh, our legislative members, it will be on your dashboard as well as on the screens to our left and our right. Uh, Director Smith, feel free to introduce anyone you have with you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. It's great to be with you all again this, this afternoon. My name is Stephen Smith. I serve as the director of TenCare, and uh, with me today to my left is Dr. Victor Wu. He is our chief medical officer. Uh, I also have uh, with me our chief operating officer, William Aaron, and then our chief of long-term services and supports, Patty Killingsworth. And so we may play some musical chairs here uh, this afternoon as we uh, give different parts of this presentation. We do have a number of slides to go through, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, uh, out of respect for your time, we'll go through these pretty quickly to try to leave as much time for questions and, and comments as possible. The presentation today is really meant to provide a, a 10 care overview and an update, um, but the theme really is the past, the present, and the future of 10 care. We are excited, we're optimistic about that future, but we know that we have challenges that are in front of us. And uh, in order to meet those challenges, uh, we really need to learn from our, from our past. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about, about some of that today. Our mission remains firm, and that is to improve lives through high quality, cost-effective care. And I hope that you will see that theme as we go through these slides today. Uh, quickly, I want to do just a, a level set and just kind of outline the fundamentals of our program. And this will be very familiar to some of you, but maybe for others it, it will kind of be a, a refresher. Our Medicaid program in Tennessee is, is it's really a traditional Medicaid program in the sense that we serve the traditional Medicaid populations. We serve primarily low-income pregnant women, children, the elderly and the disabled, and we also serve caretaker relatives. Our current population is about 1.5 million people. That is higher than our typical enrollment, and that's due to the pandemic. And we'll talk more in more detail about that in some of the later slides. As you can see, we serve about 20% of the state's population. We cover half of all the births in Tennessee, and we cover half of all the children in Tennessee. So it's, it's a substantial uh, program. We have a substantial responsibility. One thing that sometimes people are surprised to learn is that we cover populations beyond those that are federally mandated. So for example, in the caretaker relative category, we cover up to around 100% of poverty. So you compare that to Alabama, which is at 18%. Uh, Texas is at uh, 15%. Florida is at 28%. In addition, through our waiver, our 1115 waiver with the federal government, we cover additional populations such as the Katie Beckett Part B, population. We'll talk more about Katie Beckett later in the program. Um, and we also cover uh, what's called the medically needy pregnant women and children categories. So these are individuals who would otherwise be ineligible because of uh, their income status. And that's one of the reasons why it was so important for us to maintain this 1115 waiver that we have with CMS and, and why securing that 10-year agreement that we secured last month with CMS is really so important because it provides stability for our program, stability for that waiver that we otherwise wouldn't have in, in sort of this unstable federal environment. Tennessee is a managed care state. 
We are a national leader in managed care. What that means is we contract with health plans to coordinate care, uh, to manage our services, and to enter into negotiations and contracts with our providers to ensure that we have an adequate network of providers. Today, we contract with three managed care organizations. They operate statewide. Uh, later this year, we will be procuring new contracts uh, with our MCOs. Uh, that is, has been delayed a year. Uh, we were actually supposed to do that last year, but that was delayed so that we could focus and so our MCOs could focus on the pandemic. While Tennessee was an early adopter of, of managed care and we were an innovator, it's really not new anymore. 70% of all of uh, the individuals that are served by Medicaid are served by managed care. So that's 70% of all the Medicaid population in the nation. And that is because managed care has really proven to be a, a, a driver in ensuring that we provide the right care at the right time in the right settings. And that improves both quality and, and also efficiency. The last thing I'll point to on this slide is that, of course, Medicaid is a, it's a federal program, and so we partner with the federal government to ensure care. Um, and so it's a shared financial responsibility. And uh, in Tennessee, we receive about 65% uh, of, that, of that payment, that share is the federal government share. We cover the other 35%. During the pandemic and during this emergency, we are getting an enhanced federal match. And so that equates to about 6.2% on top of the 65%. Medicaid, no, no secret here, it takes up a large portion of state budgets. And um, our budget, of course, is a reflection of that. But, but I would contend, and I'll show you, show you all a slide um, in, a, in a bit, that we actually lead the nation in terms of our ability to limit our cost growth in a manner that is responsible and reasonable. But that's not a given, and it really is dependent upon our actions going forward. TenCare has a long but uh, an imperfect history uh, today, we're known as having one of the best managed Medicaid programs in the country, but that, that was not always the case. In my role now, since I uh, became director in, in March I've, uh, of last year, I've really tried to spend a lot of time learning about the history of TenCare um, and doing that so that we can uh, work to not make some of the same mistakes and also learn from the successes that we have achieved over uh, the last couple decades. It wasn't that long ago, really, if you think about it, that we were experiencing double-digit growth trends in TenCare. Uh, we had these double-digit growth trends. We had a very instable, uh, there's a lot of instability with our health plans. Uh, we had a lack of proper utilization management, and it threatened the very existence of TenCare. Uh, in fact, projections showed that the TenCare budget was going to eat every, almost every available new revenue dollar by the year 2008. Uh, I think the exact figure was 91% of every new revenue dollar that was available to the state was going to be subsumed by TenCare. To put that in perspective, if we continued on that track and continued to experience double-digit growth trends year over year, today our budget would be nearly $40 billion. That is a staggering number. Um, it almost seems made up. I had to check myself multiple times on that number, and it actually is, it's accurate. It, that, that's close to the amount of the entire proposed state budget for FY22. Um, again, it's, it, it's staggering. It does seem, uh, it seems like it's made up, but, it, but if you ask the eight members of the House that are here today that were here at the time, including Chairman Hawk, I think that he would confirm that that's how dire the situation was. So clearly that was not sustainable. Uh, and so the executive branch and the legislative branches, they partnered together to make real reforms in 2004. And while the reductions in the, in the members that we served, uh, that kind of garnered the most attention, that actually wasn't the main driver for the cost containment. Um, in fact, if you look at the decade prior to 2004, you'll see that the TenCare program grew by about 22% in terms of membership, but the cost grew by 224% over that same time period. So what that shows us is that there were actually other reforms that were made and more important reforms that were made at that time and after. Among those things, and perhaps most important, uh, were effective utilization management, uh, through appropriate medical necessity determinations, 
We had stable health plans that were operating on a statewide basis. And what that did is it provided consistency and stability in 10 care. And that is really what is required for success from a 10 care management perspective, but also from a provider perspective and from a mem member perspective. And so, yes, there were certainly cost containment measures, but I think that there's often this idea that controlling cost growth must translate into a reduction in quality or access. And it's actually not true. I think it's, it's exactly the opposite. Um, we've proven as a state that cost containment and quality improvements go hand in hand and are actually dependent upon each other. So controlling costs, coordinating care, properly managing utilization means that you can actually provide more services and serve more people and do so without breaking the state budget. And that's evidenced by some of the key quality metrics that, uh, and performance that we've experienced within TenCare in recent years. And to talk more about that, I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Dr. Wu. Thank you, Director Smith. And as uh, Director Smith mentioned, we take it very seriously that quality is our truly our number one mission for what we provide, uh, both in, in terms of improving the health care outcomes of our members, but also overall improving the health of the members we serve. And I want to just highlight a few of the uh, of those accomplishments. Um, you know, it is a never ending quest to improve the quality for our members and the quality of the care that we provide. But we do take it comprehensively and holistically. We look at every single one of those populations that uh, Director Smith mentioned, from infants and children to their parents who take care of them to pregnant moms who are um, starting a, a family to uh, our elderly populations or even those our, our members who are disabled. And so in each of those categories, we continue to focus on ways that we can drive improved access and improve quality of care to really monitor their health outcomes, as well as the overall health that they're receiving and move them on uh, in, in, in their personal journey toward, toward better health. A couple of the ones I highlight from the, uh, the kids' perspective, uh, we've really focused the last several years on well-child visits and immunizations. Uh, our patient-centered medical home, which many of you all have heard about for the last few years as part of our larger delivery system transformation. And through that work, it's really provided us the opportunity uh, to partner with our providers in a high quality value-based care perspective that's really driven an improvement in immunization rates for our, ch our kids. Similarly, a, a kind of a proxy for that is our EPSDNT, which is a really long acronym, but it stands for basically all the well child visits, so the screening, the developmental screens, the immunization, your checkups or you have when, for kids at you know, three, six, nine months, a year, two years, all the way up to their adolescence. We've been focusing on improving that, and we're really proud to show and see that we've increased, improved that rate by over 10% in the last three and a half, four years. And those are just some examples of how we focus in, with our health plans in partnership to drive the health outcomes of, our, uh, of the children that we serve. For pregnant women, as an example, we know that the opioid epidemic has really hit disproportionately. Uh, for women who uh, have um, uh, substance-involved pregnancies that are also struggling with uh, opioid addiction, and we know that is a lifelong journey of recovery. Um, but with the supports and services that we've provided, we've seen now a decrease by almost 30% uh, in the number of our neonatal abstinence syndrome births in the last three years. We're the only state in the country to, rep to, um, to report a three-year consecutive decline in our neonatal abstinence syndrome um, of births. And I think we're really proud of the work that uh, Tinker has done, but really what the entire state has done through the partnership with the General Assembly and Tennessee Together legislation with, the, with both uh, Governor Haslam and Governor Lee leadership in this area. We really believe that we're beginning to move the needle uh, in that space as well. We've also seen an increase in uh, the number of postpartum visits. So we know that that late postpartum period is a really important time. You'll hear in our budget later uh, some of our, our budget requests in order to help serve our maternal members more. Um, but we're seeing an increased use of uh, postpartum visits, and we hope that can continued efforts in supporting our moms even after they deliver will not only help the mom but also help the infant as well. In the long-term supports and services space, I think we're really incredibly proud as uh, leading the, the country in that, thanks to the work of uh, many folks, but, um, and you'll hear from uh, Patty Killingsworth in a few minutes, but we're seeing nearly 47% of all of our, um, uh, of all of our Tinker members that are 65 and older uh, individually choosing to, uh, to receive services either at home, to live more independently, or to find ways to be more cost-effective in maintaining their autonomy as they age and they age in their own home. And I think that's been a tremendous testament to the, the breadth and the options and the, and the innovation that we've led in the LTSS space that really delivers both high-quality care but also allows a member to have their independence and to maintain um, their choice of what is the best for them as they, as they become older in their, in their health journey. And lastly, as I mentioned, the opioid epidemic, I think, again, when the partnership with Tennessee Together the legislation and many other uh, state entities and state partners, uh, we're really seeing the number of our overexposure and the first time acute use of opioids decrease tremendously. We've decreased the number of pills that we've dispensed by almost 50% since 2017 um, in an effort toward trying to 
better use the evidence and make sure that our members who are struggling or dealing with uh, acute injuries or acute pain really get access to high quality evidence-based treatment, med, uh, med pain treatment regimens um, as well. And so those are just a couple of the areas that I wanted to highlight to really show a comprehensive view. We take it very seriously again to look at every one of our populations and how we can help support the health and the health journey of those members. Um, and we're really proud to see uh, continued uh, satisfaction, nearly 94% uh, satisfaction for the last decade on, our, on a survey that the University of Tennessee Knoxville does for us. And I will say that, again, in kind of looking at the past, as Director Smith mentioned, that number used to be in the 60%, 70% satisfaction range. But now for the last decade, we've seen it consistently 90, 92, 94, 98%. And we continue to believe that we're receiving um, positive partnerships with our members and they're really receiving the care that they need. So returning to our mission, uh, there are two components when we discuss care, and one, of course, is high quality, and the other is cost-effective, and both are extremely important. And this slide speaks to that second piece of fiscal accountability and efficiency. So it just takes basic math to understand that uh, 10 care plays a very large role uh, in our overall state budget. Um, if we are unable to reasonably contain cost, it impacts everything else that we do as a state. Uh, and that means less funding available for other state priorities, whether that be education, economic development, safety, local government, you name it. So we take this responsibility very seriously. And you will note on this slide uh, that since the year 2000, Tennessee has outperformed every single state in the country when it comes to limiting the growth of the, of the share of the state budget supporting Medicaid. So in the proposed FY22 budget, the 10 care percentage of the overall state portion of the budget is 19.7%, which is actually a decrease from last year. Now, we're able to do this, of course, by limiting our year-over-year -year, uh, growth trend, and that translate in, translates into real dollars. So, for example, if our trend rate has simply been at the state average for Medicaid programs since 2012, we would have spent an additional $2 billion to run our program. So. Not coincidentally, that is very close to the same record amount that Tennessee has invested in public education over that same time. So the cost of 10 care being average is it's substantial and it's real. We don't have the luxury of being average. We talk about that as a, as a staff uh, often. If we, if we turn our back or we rest on our laurels, if we loosen the reins on what we've done to control these healthcare cost growths, uh, if we do that, our state is impacted. And when the state is impacted, considering 10 care makes up such a large portion of the budget, there's just no way around the fact that 10 care would be impacted and we would face actual cuts in the 10 care program. And that's something that we want to avoid, if at all possible. Uh, it may seem counterintuitive, but controlling costs and trend means that we can actually do more. We can do more on quality, we can do more on access, and we can do more on services. A perfect example of this is the Katie Beckett program, and I'm going to ask Patty to come up uh, for an update on this program. I know it's a program that's very important to the General Assembly. It's very important to you all. It's actually a, a legislative initiative. Uh, we wanted to be sure to give you an update on where we are with Katie Beckett and then also uh, give you all an update on a very another very important initiative that we are working on relative to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Patty. Thank you very much. And Dr. Wu, forgive me, I should have asked you to introduce yourself into the microphone and I'll ask you next time. Thank you, Ms. Killingsworth. If you could uh, uh, state your name and your position with TenCare as uh, just for the record as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Patty Killingsworth. I'm the Chief of Long-Term Services and Supports, and it's a pleasure to speak with you for just a couple of minutes today. As Stephen pointed out just a couple of slides ago, managing our program well really does allow the state to focus on other important priorities. And when we talk about the Katie Beckett program, those priorities have names and faces and they have dedicated families that those of you who were here in 2019, along with we who were here in 2019, will never forget. Um, most of you will recall, and in fact, many of you really helped lead and support the passage of the Katie Beckett legislation, the approval of the $27 million in state funding, um, $77 million total to establish a new standalone Katie Beckett program that serves children with complex medical needs and disabilities who otherwise wouldn't qualify for Medicaid because of their parents' income or assets. 
it is another area where Tennessee really is leading the country in an innovative new approach that we hope will allow us to be able to provide services to all of the children and families who need them by offering a two-part program. It offers Part A, which provides full Medicaid benefits, as well as a wraparound package of home and community-based services for children with the most complex needs and disabilities. And it also provides a capped package of Medicaid-like of, of Medicaid -like benefits, home and community-based services-like benefits that help children who aren't on Medicaid to purchase private insurance and for their parents to be able to buy them things that that private insurance doesn't cover for them. It's that Medicaid diversion program that will allow us to serve more children and families and that really is unique among states across the country. We finally got approval from our federal partners to begin the program in early November and implemented just a few short weeks later and since then have been able to enroll more than 400 children in that program, literally uh, changing the lives of many children and their families as they're now able to access these services and supports thanks to the good work that you all have done. Turning to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more, as Stephen mentioned, about our continued efforts to innovate and also to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our programs. We think there's another opportunity that will provide us to um, position us to be able to offer services to more people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who need them by integrating all of the programs and benefits that serve that population into our managed care program. That includes home and community-based services in the waiver programs that are operated by DIDD, the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, as well as ICF IID services, intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Really important to understand that the, the people who receive those services have been in managed care since 1994. So they are in managed care today for their physical and behavioral health services. Beginning July 1, their same health plan will begin to also pay for their long-term services and supports with direct oversight by DIDD as well as by TenCare. By making those changes, we will be able to create a single person-centered system of service delivery for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We'll bring the department's expertise in serving and leading this population to bear across all of our programs and build on health plan partnerships and the successes that we've seen both in terms of outcome and efficiencies in employment and community first choices. We can leverage those increased efficiencies then to be able to serve more people, including people from the waiting list, subject of course to the budget process, and take advantage of an increased revenue opportunity via the HMO premium tax that will help us to avoid reductions that might otherwise have been necessary during difficult budget times. Also really important, especially to the people that we serve and to their families, is even though these benefits will become part of managed care on July 1st, we're really approaching this integration in a very incremental way with a, um, a focus on ensuring continuity of the services that people receive, making sure that they will keep the same entity responsible for their case management, the same providers available to deliver their services, while we also provide new and exciting opportunities for them to increase their independence and really live their best lives in the community. So last month, this committee and the General Assembly discussed and approved our TenCare 3 waiver, otherwise known as the Shared Savings Waiver. And, and this was a first of its kind Medicaid financing model. So it, this, this offered an unprecedented opportunity for Tennessee to be rewarded for its efficiency and to bring in additional federal dollars to our state that, that we could then reinvest into our program and enhance benefits and services to our members. And I won't spend much time on this because we've, we've talked about it. Um, but it is a, it's, a, it's a perfect example of the kinds of things that we can do because of the successes that we've achieved over the last 10, 20 years and because of the reforms that have been made. Um, it's dependent upon successful management. Um, and if we are average, I'll go back to that, if we are an average Medicaid program, then this shared savings opportunity and this waiver is just not a possibility. And if we don't maintain our success, uh, if we don't continue to do the, the things that got us here, then we won't have shared savings and we will have missed an opportunity. Um, again, managing the, the growth of healthcare costs leads to improvements in quality and access, and shared savings will lead to enhanced benefits 
and services. And that's really the whole point of 10 Care 3. Also, I just want to uh, point out before I leave this slide that despite what you may be seeing on Twitter or other social media, 10 Care 3 is alive and well. It has not been rescinded. Uh, we are moving forward, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. But there is no change. There has been no change in status of our 10 Care 3 waiver. I want to pivot uh, to COVID and our response to the pandemic. Um, it certainly won't come as a surprise to, to anyone to, to know that the, the work of our agency was really focused on uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, particularly, particularly our response. So over the last year, this has really been a focus of ours. And during this time, we've had one overriding priority, and that is to ensure that our members have access to care. So this involved providing a number of flexibilities, some of those related to the method in which we deliver healthcare services. Telehealth, of course, is the, is the most notable example there. We expanded access to nearly all of our professional services via telehealth, um, and that was a real, a real lifesaver for our members and also for our providers. I, I mentioned earlier our priority of ensuring that we have an adequate network of providers, and clearly we can't provide access to care unless we have providers that are available for those members to, uh, to, to receive care. And no question our providers experienced some, some really dire uh, challenges and circumstances during this time. So utilization has been impacted. It continues to be uh, impacted in many cases, and therefore revenue was impacted. And in some cases, it wasn't low utilization, but it was just the increased cost of providing care. So that whether that be PPE or staffing or overtime, uh, all of those things. So we did several things to assist our providers. First, we allowed a number of administrative flexibilities to allow our hospitals and our nursing homes to uh, focus on care. And then second, we provided direct assistance uh, with revenue through accelerated payments and through direct provider relief payments to our heavily Medicaid dependent providers. So that includes home and community-based services, uh, that includes mental and behavioral health, dental, and then primary care. And I'm, I'm proud to say that we were able to infuse a total of more than $40 million uh, for those four categories, which really was a lifeline to those providers. I should also point out that we distributed $118 million to our nursing facilities through the nursing home assessment, which greatly assisted our nursing homes and facilities, and we appreciate the partnership with THCA on, on that front. On the subject of testing, 10 care and Medicaid programs throughout the country have a, a big role to play. We've worked to ensure that all of our 10 care members have access to testing. To date, we've paid for more than 360,000 tests statewide, but we know that we have uh, our 10 care members that are also uh, receiving tests through the drive through site. So there are many more uh, tests that are being provided, but we have actually paid for 360,000 of those tests. We're also working with our Department of Health, with our local health departments, and our health plans to ensure that Medicaid members will have access to the vaccine once they become available. So that includes transportation supports, care coordination, and then paying for the administration costs. Um, I just wanna, uh, before I leave this slide, I wanna just uh, once again publicly thank our providers uh, for all of their efforts uh, during this time. Um, I can't say enough uh, about uh, their efforts, their resiliency, their flexibility. They have been true partners with us, and we just cannot be successful as an agency in, in serving our members without the partnership with our providers. And, and um, I didn't want to leave this without publicly thanking them once again. We thought it would be useful for, for you all to get a snapshot of what utilization has looked like during this time. And so uh, to talk more about that, I'm going to turn this back over to to Dr. Wu. I'll give you this shot, Dr. Wu, to introduce yourself, and uh, although we've met you already, and, and tell us your position again. Thank you, sir. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chairman Hawk and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Victor Wu, the Chief Medical Officer at 10Care. Um, as Director Smith mentioned, it, it, we've often been asked, you know, how does utilization look? How has the healthcare industry been responding to COVID? And this is just a snapshot. I'm not going to kind of go over each line item for those of you that are interested to kind of see how the pandemic um, has impacted our the, the big categories of care that we tend to track. And you'll see kind of the 
early uh, pandemic period is on the first column, uh, March to May, uh, when uh, our state was in a uh, in a different um, kind of uh, approach on, around uh, the lockdown, and then in June through October, seeing how some of that has rebounded uh, over time and and overall the, the change. And so, in some categories, you're seeing that we're starting to near uh, pre-pandemic uh, utilization, and some areas still remain uh, a little depressed. I think one of the areas that I do want to highlight is that um, uh, in both in partnership and under the leadership of TenCare, but with our health plans, we've really focused on some of the major categories that we know um, that a pandemic is going to hit, that we will have long-term health consequences, things like preventative care, things like well child visits, immunizations. Those things tend to kind of have been reduced significantly um, with just with the decreased utilization, yet we know that those are long-term investments and for the health of the population. And you'll notice that um, our well child visits, we've made some, even though we're down for the entire year, uh, we've made some real gains. We're actually uh, higher than we were last year as we're playing catch-up, and we will continue to, to really use the types of investments in care coordination supports that our health plans offer to really drive some of those preventative services. The other piece I'll mention is just that telehealth has been a tremendous uh, benefit to our members uh, during the pandemic. It's really, um, again, been an area where our health plans pivoted quickly, worked very closely with the providers to open up opportunities for telehealth, um, both telephonic uh, visits as well as audiovisual visits uh, to work with both um, providers in rural communities and in, in urban settings to really allow for those types of services to be delivered um, in, in, in the, to kind of fill in that gap when, uh, when in-person visits weren't uh, really um, as, as accessible as they were in the past. And maybe the best way to tell the story is honestly, I'd, I'd like to share with you, if you don't mind, a short patient story. Uh, we think about this oftentimes in terms of our members and, uh, and there's countless numbers of stories we could tell, but one of them I think just emblematic of the types of supports and services that our, our health plans provide. There was a, a nine-year-old patient of ours who, uh, I call them patients, uh, hard for me not to think of them as patients as a physician, but a nine-year-old member, we'll call her Anne, but she's had a complicated medical history, history of breast cancer, history of heart disease, um, uh, arthritis, um, as well as severe asthma. And she was living at home, fairly functional, able to move around most for the uh, most part on her own, uh, but she does have a caregiver who came in to visit her three, four times a week for a couple of hours to support her. That caregiver, unfortunately, received COVID, uh, got COVID and was unable to come in um, and had been in her home, but then had to stop. And during those few days where the caregiver wasn't checking in on her as regularly, uh, Anne had a fall at her home and had a, a serious injury to her foot. Um, she actually, our MCO care coordinator is one of our health plans who regularly checks on our, our high-risk members who have these chronic conditions, um, kind of connected with Anne, and, and Anne told her a story and immediately set up a home visit the very next day. So our MCO care coordinator went into her home was able to set up a telehealth visit with a physician, orthopedic surgeon, who was able to look at her uh, ankle over telehealth with some pictures, do a couple of tests with the help of the MCO care coordinator. Um, and that allowed the physician to diagnose and say, look, you, you're you gonna be okay, you need some supports, but you don't need to come into the ER, you don't need x-rays. And that Anne was able to stay at home, um, receive the care coordinator, set her up for physical therapy services, for rehab services, and got her an in-home test because she was also worried about being exposed to COVID through the previous worker. And this is the type of levels of supports and care that our MCOs are going above and beyond during the pandemic um, in order to really provide the care for our members. And that story of Anne, I think, is just emblematic of, of how our healthcare industry, how our providers, and how our health plans have really tried to increase the level of supports and really rally around the needs during the pandemic. And so hopefully that gives you a flavor of the type of services that we're doing and we're trying to work on it, really improve the quality and the access for our, our members. All right, Mr. Chairman, to, to wrap up here, I'm gonna ask William to come up and we're gonna give you all an update on where we are with our enrollment and, and also um, walk through uh, how the enhanced federal dollars uh, have, um, have impacted uh, TenCare. Thank you, and sir, you are recognized for your name and position. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, my name is William Aaron, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Operating Officer for TenCare. Um, wanted to talk, just as, uh, as Director Smith said, just a moment about um, enrollment um, and about some special financing that we are currently receiving from the federal government. Um, so I, I think most folks here are familiar with the fact that the, uh, the federal government has passed a series of COVID relief bills um, over both the Trump administration and now working through the Biden administration. Um, the second through the Trump administration included a temporary provision that essentially as long as the public health emergency was in effect, all state Medicaid programs would receive a higher level, a higher share of federal funding than they would otherwise get. And that is an increase, as you heard Director Smith mention uh, previously, of 6.2% percent 
right? So if you assume that our normal share of federal funding is about 65%, 66%, well, now we're at 71, 72%, right? This was a mechanism that was used back during the Great Recession, if you will, in uh, 2008 to 2010 from the Obama administration as a way to both support Medicaid programs, but also to very quickly allow states to free up their dollars, right? So it has a dual function in that role. Um, one of the requirements that the federal government put in this coronavirus relief bill, however, was that for states to be able to receive those enhanced federal dollars, and it is significant dollars, as we'll see in just a, a moment, um, that they would have to suspend all re-verification activity of members, right? And just so that members of the committee are clear, we are required by the federal government to at least once every 12 months reach out to every member in the program and ask them for information to ensure that they are still eligible for membership. Um, for us to receive this enhanced federal match, we had to cease all of that activity. So effectively, we stopped that activity completely as of last March. Now, I will say there's nothing unique to Tennessee about this. Every state uh, and every state Medicaid program has made this choice, um, right? So that we are very much in good company on this front. But if you look at the slide, um, what we wanted to do is to highlight the impact that that has. Now, certainly because in tough times economically, more people are eligible for Medicaid because they lose jobs, they have to take jobs that pay less, et cetera. Um, family circumstances change. Um, and we know that you know, there has been some portion of enrollment that comes from basically the state of the economy. But particularly here in Tennessee, where the economy has bounced back well, um, and we have, as a government, managed effectively through it, what we're seeing in the majority of our enrollment increase comes from the suspension of our re-verification activities, right? And again, as long as we receive those enhanced federal matching dollars, we will continue to suspend the re-verification of members. So what I'd uh, direct you to, members, if you would take a look at, uh, at the chart, the blue line represents what we know for certain, right? Uh, and it reflects our enrollment going up through the end of this March. Um, the way that the federal legislation was set up, and I'm sorry, members, this gets a little nerdy, so bear with me, um, but the public health emergency enhanced FMAP, those extra dollars, is, are set on a quarter by quarter basis. So as long as on January 1st of this year, we were still in the public health emergency, even if it was just that one day, we would get dollars for the full quarter. Come, let's see, January, February, March, April 1st, right? If we're still in the public health emergency, we will get public health, we will get those matching enhanced federal dollars for the full quarter, right? Well, so the, broadly speaking, the enrollment constraints and the, the, the constraints on re-verification, the maintenance of effort requirement, this is what it's called, follows those dollars. So what we know right now, sitting here in, in late February, um, is that we are good through the end of March, right? We will uh, continue to receive those enhanced federal dollars through the end of March, um, and we will continue to have our re-verification suspended through the end of March in, co in concordance with that, right? That's what we know for sure, right? And that's what's represented in the blue line. Obviously, when the requirement, and again, this is not unique to Tennessee, this is all, this is every Medicaid program, um, when that requirement is lifted and the enhanced federal dollars are no longer available, um, we will begin re-verification activities. And that's why you see the, the membership line starting to come down um, after March. Now, that's what we know for sure, right? And uh, as I always tell the folks I work with, uh, you know, I will wake up like 12.01 a.m. on the very first day of the first day of the quarter, like, are we still in? Yes, we're good, right? We, we don't know for sure until we get there. Um, however, it is interesting, members, that the Biden administration um, has, although they have not formally put a policy in place for this yet, they have communicated that their intent, or at least they believe that the likelihood is, is probably a better way to put it, that the public health emergency will be in place through the rest of this calendar year. Um, so taking that assumption, um, we have also added that line to the chart, and that's the red line, right? And so you would see that up through December, our enrollment would continue to increase until approximately 1.7 million members is our projection, at which point then we would anticipate that that requirement um, to, uh, that maintenance of effort requirement come to an end as the enhanced federal match came to an end, and then that enrollment would begin, would begin to decline as we began to 
ask members, are you still eligible? And would find that just the normal turn that comes with Medicaid, it's nothing unusual about it, every state experiences it, um, that enrollment would begin to come down. So with those additional folks, that means that there are additional costs. Um, and members of the committee, we wanted to share with you all that we feel very, very comfortable um, that uh, yes, we will have those additional costs, but that we will have the dollars available to pay for that, right? Um, if you look at the, the impact, and again, remember what happens here is that instead of getting our normal 65, 66 cents on the dollar from the federal government, we're getting 71 to 72 cents from the federal government for every dollar, right? What that means is that we've got these levels of state funding that are freed up. If you look at, say, the first six months of calendar year 2020, so January through June of 2020, um, we had $243 million in state funding that was freed up, right? That, uh, again, part of that has gone to our reserves um, to enable us to help pay for these expenses, which, let's be clear, we're getting all the revenue now. The expenses are going to stretch out over time. So we have to be prudent and plan for that. Um, part of that also went to help stabilize state government in a very challenging time, right? And we're proud to be able to, to be a part of that solution for the state government as well. But you can see what our projections are as we move through here. Um, you know, we're looking at approximately 140 million for this quarter. Um, again, and that's what we know right now, right? Uh, again, we will see if there is some official action by the Biden administration um, that extends that through the rest of the calendar year. Um, but all that to say, you know, members of the committee, uh, yes, we are seeing uh, an increase in enrollment. We understand why. We're tracking it on basically a almost day-by-day -day basis. Um, but we're also very comfortable um, that we will have, through this mechanism, the dollars to be able to cover the expenses associated with covering those people. All right, Mr. Chairman and members, that completes our prepared remarks. We appreciate uh, your attention uh, to those and again appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you and happy to answer any questions or listen to any concerns that you all have. Thank you very much and committee members uh, will be taking questions now. Anyone have any questions or comments? Representative Mitchell you're recognized and we'll go to Representative Smith after that. Representative uh, Mitchell you're recognized. Yeah I'm just curious so you're telling this committee that you've had no interaction with the Biden administration whatsoever in regards to your waiver. They have not given you any instructions, any advice, any advisory on things that you might need to change in your waiver. That is correct. We have, we have gotten, there's been no status change to our waiver. That is correct. Okay. So you've heard nothing from them. That is great. We've received a letter. I think that's that maybe that's some of the confusion. Maybe I should just talk about what this letter is. So at the end of the Trump administration, the CMS administrator at the time provided a letter to every state Medicaid director that has an 1115 waiver. We have an 1115 waiver. And what that did is it set out some procedures, uh, some some additional due process rights that states would have in the event that the federal government chose to take an action on the 1115 waiver. So we signed that, as did every state that has an 1115 waiver. We submitted that back. The Biden administration came in. They issued uh, their own letter recently that rescinded that previous letter. But I want to be very clear, that letter is not specific to the 10 care 3 waiver. It, it relates to 1115 waivers in general, and it just speaks to the process that the federal government would go through if they are to, to take action on a waiver. But it doesn't change the status of our waiver at all. So I just want, I want, to, be, I want to be really clear about that. Yeah, and and my, my only other thing, and yeah, I remember when the Breast Administration had to make some tough choices, and it was tough financial times. We didn't have a billion dollars laying around or another 300 million we could stick in the rainy day fund at that time. We're trying to keep the lights on, keep the state employees paid, keep government working for the people. So I'm hearing a lot of saving money, saving money. Well, TenCare wasn't created to save money. It was created to save lives. And I hope we don't get caught up 
in dollars and cents and lose focus on what teen care is supposed to be about. You know, we can put all these guardrails, you know, we can narrow formularies, we can do all that, but it still doesn't remove the fact there's 350,000 Tennesseans who need health care. And, and I hope we don't lose fact, the focus that, you know, our goal should be to help provide as much health care to as many Tennesseans as we possibly can, especially in time when we're sticking money in the rainy day fund. Because I can guarantee you those 300 and some thousand Tennesseans, it's raining on them. You know, it's a rainy day in their household. So that being said, let, let's just think about that. Thank you, Representative Mitchell, and I appreciate that. And we'll uh, refer folks back to slide number two as well as we're looking at the the ten care enrollment numbers and, and the percentage. Uh, and when you and I had some discussions early, early on back in the Bredesen days, uh, we're where we are in terms of numbers right now as well. So thank you very much for your for your comments, Representative Mitchell. Uh, Chair Lady Smith, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and congratulations, Director, on uh, keeping that uh, 10 Care 3 intact. We're, we're cheering you on because we know that, that more Tennesseans could potentially receive coverage. My question, if you wouldn't mind going back, Director, to one of the more recent slides about the FMAP and how it was broken down quarterly, um, just for clear, that was it right there. Um, just so that I'll understand, um, there was a moment at which there were $243 million uh, f was awarded from the federal government to our state, and you mentioned that was that reflects a 6.2% increase from that the uh, that which would have been typical for FMAP, and, and I understand going to stabilize other parts of the government. Clearly, it was raining on all of us at one point, but uh, of those funds, have those all been spent, allocated, expended, or are there monies that are uh, continuing to be put forward in other programs? Do you have things allocated um, for, with that sum of money in, in anything that's gonna fall in quarter one or two of this year? Or, or you know, to let us know how that those 6.2% that increase is being utilized outside of stabilizing government through some sort of an accounting um, opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Sure, and I'll, I'll uh, appreciate that question. I'm gonna kick it over to William to talk specifics. What, what I would just reiterate though is we, we really think about these expenses, these pandemic expenses, the COVID-19 related expenses as not just one fiscal year, because we know it, it started in FY20 and it's going to extend past FY22. And so um, when we think about the expenses and this revenue that's coming in, we kind of think about it collectively, expand, you know, going through those multiple fiscal years. But William, I'll let you uh, speak more to the specific question. Sure. Yeah, no, it, it's an excellent question, uh, Madam Chair. And, and I'll just echo what, what Director Smith said. It is a situation, and I think this is part of your point as well, where you know, essentially we're getting this sort of bolus of dollars up front. And so we need to make sure that we're being good stewards of that for the full duration of our costs, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's absolutely part of what we do is, you know, we iterate our projections and our models for enrollment as well as for testing and treatment costs. Um, we've done so many versions of these, I've almost lost count, um, as our data improves. And we've gotten much better about it as you would hope that we would, right, over the course of this pandemic. Um, and we are in very frequent conversation with the budget office in FNA about what our dollars look like and what we project our expenses are going to be. Um, so uh, part of the, the challenging nature of this, Madam Chair, is that, again, I can't promise you that we're going to have any enhanced FMAP dollars past March 30th. Um, this has been one of the main sources of concern and complaint from states to both the Trump administration and now continuing to the Biden administration, right? Um, is that it, it, you know, it's hard to plan, right? Um, if you don't know whether you're going to get those dollars or not. Um, so uh, you know, we're hopeful given recent communications, again, there's gonna be some more certainty around that going forward. Um, the, the overwhelming majority of these dollars, Madam Chair, are um, going to be necessary for us for several years to pay for the impacts of this pandemic on the 10 care program. For example, the enrollment model that you saw, you'll notice the lines start coming down, but we only showed you through state fiscal year 22, right, which is the budget that is before the legislature at this point. 
we have costs going all the way out projected into state fiscal year 24 um, that we will have to cover. So 22, 23, and 24, and significant dollars in this fiscal year that again, the 21 budget never contemplated COVID. Um, so there are going to be huge expenses over a long period of time that these dollars are going to be necessary to cover. And, and part of that, I'll just add, is that William talked about this, but the, the emergency is you know, kind of shut off, um, but general consensus is it's gonna take 12 months in order to go through the redetermination process for all of those members. So our costs, increased costs continue and, but we're no longer getting that enhanced federal right. matching dollar. So um, the word of caution there is that some may look at our fund balance and, and think that it's inflated, but the reality is we're gonna have to use, uh, very likely gonna have to use those dollars to account for those costs after the emergency uh, goes away. Does that, does that answer your question? Any other members? I do have a few questions and some comments myself. Uh, if we could go back to slide number four, as you presenting the, the populations that we're serving, um, we definitely have an aging population in our state. Now look at the third, the third segment of, of the slide that you have there. Uh, we're seeing some increases in needs of our elderly popula population. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, the uh, provision of long-term services and, and supports where we are there and where we see ourselves going in the future yeah i'll ask patty to come up i'll uh, defer to the expert here thank you mr aaron i was going to ask you what the fund balance was but that's okay no i'm just kidding so <laughs> and thank you miss killingsworth you're you're recognized Oops, thank you mr chairman i'm happy to talk about that and really appreciate you raising the issue um one of the things that the pandemic has done is really shine a light on the critical importance of long-term services and supports and how fragile the nature of that service system can be. Um, the good news is that this body, now over a decade ago, took some really definitive steps to vastly improve our position relative to planning for the future needs of an aging population uh, by creating the Choices Program. And since that program launched in, in 2010, we have um, been able to significantly expand access to home and community-based services. If you ask most people where they want to receive care, when they begin to need care, they will tell you they want to stay at home. Um, and we want to honor those choices and, and really provide supports where people need them. Um, interestingly enough, provided in the right way, care at home is also much more cost effective and that has enabled us to serve significantly more people, literally thousands more people in their homes and communities with long-term services and supports by providing those services more efficiently. Um, we have, when we started out the Choices Program, we had 18% of our population who were receiving services in the community. The rest of the individuals were receiving their services in nursing homes. And now we're at 46.5% of people, as you saw on the slide, who are receiving services in their home and community. So we've gone from a little over 4,000 to um, over 12,000. At one point, we were actually at 13,000 people who are receiving services in their homes and communities. And we've done that without significant burden on the state's budget, simply by honoring choices and allowing people to receive services more cost effectively. Um, that really is, I think, our future, is continuing to find ways to honor the choices that people want to make about where they receive services and to support them in receiving those services in their home in cost-effective ways whenever we can. That's a part of our reason for really moving forward with IDD integration. That too, by the way, is an aging population. There is among that population a group of individuals who are, who are becoming older. Um, and, and there's also a group of people who are coming out of school and they're young and they want opportunities to live lives that we live. They want jobs and they want lives and we need to begin to provide supports in ways that enable them to really achieve their maximum level of function and independence and success in everyday life and then wrap supports around them where necessary. So I think that is our future, is to continue down that path, leveraging all that we've learned through managed care and really focusing on the provision of home and community-based services. Thank you very much. And, and I'll jump on my soapbox a little bit here. As 
Director Smith was talking about the, the, the value and the thanks for our provider community out there. And they have, uh, they've, they've had a tough time. It's been a challenging year to, to say the least. And I want to ensure that we continue provider sustainability, that the population that we're serving with this, uh, with these choices dollars and these choices program, that the providers are able to continue. And I know that there are some concerns. Several of us have had meetings and conversations uh, about a, about a, a rate and a three tiered rate right now. Um, we can talk dollars and cents all day long and how we justify those dollars. Uh, but there are certain pulls and, and tugs on us right now as a legislative body that we ensure that, um, I think there was a conversation I had with someone earlier. We don't know there's a, a provider crisis until there's a provider crisis. And, and just to ensure that, uh, that the folks that are providing these in-home services are able to continue. Uh, that's important to us, and I know that as we're looking with, with Mr. Aram, who was speaking earlier, to sharpen that pencil as we have those discussions uh, going forward, that's, that's important that, uh, that we achieve that balance going forward. Um, I will mention as, as we're having this conversation, uh, I know that the Senate Committee on Health met recently on, uh, on behavioral health issues and some concerns coming from the behavioral health community in terms of providers. Um, once again, I want to ensure that we have a stable uh, provider network in order to continue the levels of care that we've got. And, uh, and what that looks like, finding that balance, um, I, I, we're going to be charged with that as a legislative body as we work through the budget document over the next eight weeks, as well as this committee and, and you are going to be charged with that. So my, my encouragement is to you is to have an open ear as we work with our MCOs, as we work with our provider organizations, uh, to ensure that uh, that we achieve that happy happy medium, as the old saying goes, where uh, no one's in love with with the presentation, but they can live with it. Uh, to where we're we're all going to have a little bit of something we wish we could change, uh, but but we can live with it and and continue that stability uh, within our provider community as well as within our. Uh, our MCOs. So, thank you. Thanks for allowing me on my soapbox there. Um, Representative Smith, I think you had a follow up. Uh, you recognize Representative Smith. I, I did, and blame the chairman because he provoked a thought. Um, early, early in the uh, COVID response, I know I had several conversations with different people about the how uh, PPE is treated in the world of reimbursement. And, and I know that you all have eloquently spoke about new costs that have come up. It's kind of like the woodwork effect of this COVID response and how they're going to be long lasting. You know, another cost of doing business of a provider is an enormous amount of PPE. And those are costs that are, are those now being uh, uh, reimbursed in any capacity uh, or reflecting in the cost of treating patients? Is that something that is incorporated into a billing code? Is that something that's being included in an upcharge in any capacity when you're dealing with a COVID patient so that that's not a cost that's being eaten by a provider? And instead, it's viewed as part of an episode where there's going to be increased costs when you're dealing with any sort of uh, like an infection, uh, whether it be communicable, COVID, viral, um, but is, is that something that you all have changed and, and are now providing an accommodation for PPE? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may need some help from William and Patty. You may be able to speak to the nursing facilities. Um, I, I, I can point to the, um, the one-time investment that we made you know, early on to uh, those heavily Medicaid-dependent providers, the HCBS providers in particular, where we did address the PPE cost. Um, but for nursing facilities, I do believe that that's part of their cost reports, but I may need to defer to, uh, to William. I have him come up here. So Mr. Aram, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. William Aaron, Chief Operating Officer of TenCare. Um, yeah, it, sorry, is that, can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, yeah, so we have addressed this in several ways, um, Madam Chair. So um, one of which, as, uh, as you heard Director Smith mention, was, you know, when we, and this was, you know, 60 days into the, the COVID-19 crisis, right? Um, if then, but probably not even that far in. 
um, we saw that there were certain classes of providers who were, you know, extraordinarily heavily, unusually dependent, right, proportionally on Medicaid dollars and knew that they were in particularly dire straits. And so, as you heard the director mention, did, you know, more than $40 million worth of sort of immediate provider payments to those folks. Um, a large part of what was driving some of those was PPE. For example, um, you know, we have built a, uh, you know, world-class network of pediatric, pediatric dentistry and dentists that will see our members, right? Because again, we have half of all the kids in the state. So that means we're responsible for half of all the children's dental work in the state. Um, and, you know, dental work in particular is one of those places where PPE is critical because you are close up constantly right up against an open mouth, right? Um, so we actually, for them, put in place uh, a rate increase um, that reflects, among other things, PPE considerations. Um, that's in place for, for a good period. Um, you know, you also heard uh, Director Smith mention nursing homes. Um, you know, we've, again, we're, we're grateful for our partnership. You know, we have great partnerships with our providers. Um, THCA certainly absolutely up there. Um, you know, we've pushed out significant additional dollars to them to cover, because goodness, for them it's PPE, it's staffing, there's just a ton of additional cost um, to help them be stable through that as well. Um, and in addition, where we do have certain providers who, for whom cost reports drive what we pay, right? It's not all providers, but certain ones we do. Nursing homes, that can factor in our ICF providers, for example, so we know that those costs are going to be coming in into, and will be part of what gets paid going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments from our members? I want to thank you all very much. Um, as, as you know, it's, it's an issue with great depth, and it's, it is not an easy discussion to have. It's a very critically important discussion as it is a substantial part of our budget, as it was mentioned before. Um, you know, one in five Tennesseans are affected by our, the program, and, and it, it means a lot. And the fact that we are engaging in these conversations uh, is, is, is very important going forward. I think that uh, you've heard us loudly and clearly where, where, we, uh, where we feel like we need to go as a, as a legislature and as a, as a state. Uh, I thank you for the work that you do. Um, in it being thankless, I'm going to say thank you uh, that, that you folks have, have really done a great job of informing us, uh, of managing, and, uh, and I'm very proud, to, uh, proud that you're Tennesseans. So thank you so much. Uh, seeing no further business before this committee, uh, we will be adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>